Hey everyone, thank you for having me at this wonderful celebration. It's been super fun. Uh, like I uh, said, my name's Colin Leota. Uh, on Twitter, I'm at Viren. I run a small game development studio called Quick Step Labs. Uh, in the past, I've made a, a ton of different games. Uh, I was responsible for the uh, Lifeline series of choose your own adventure text based real time games, which is quite a mouthful, but they're a lot of fun and great stories. Uh, also made a ton of other games. Uh, many of them have been huge uh, flops. Uh, others have been big successes, like Fairway Solitaire or Big Fish Casino, or my personal favorite, Hyper Disc Frenzy, which is super awesome. Uh, but I'm not going to talk about any of those games today. Instead, I'm going to talk about a very sort of funny and different way of applying a roguelike and uh, some of the lessons I learned along the way. So this story all starts with the MIT Mystery Hunt. Uh, for those who are familiar, it's a thing. Uh, for those who aren't, a uh, brief summary. It's a very, 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 very difficult puzzle hunt that happens over the course of about three to four days. Um, the puzzles are very difficult. They are designed to take between two to 20 person hours to solve per puzzle. There are usually several hundred of those puzzles. And in order to uh, solve them, you will usually need a team of about like 30 to 70 different people. And the most important part of the rules of the hunt is that whichever team wins, they get to write the next year's hunt. And my team has been very, very proud over the last 20 years of always coming in second. And it's been great until last year. Whoops, we won. So this is a picture of our team running around through the MIT campus. Uh, the goal of the hunt each year is to find a coin. Uh, this was the coin that we found. It was a really cool D&D-themed mystery hunt that had this beautiful dragon coin uh, that was very D&D styled. So great, we won. We were super happy until the next day when we woke up and realized, oh no, uh, we actually need to write 140 different puzzles. And with a team of 70 people, you might think 140 puzzles, that's trivial. It's not a problem. But these puzzles are insane. They are designed to be very deep with many different layers of stuff going on with them. They're designed to be very clever. They should be very fun and they should ultimately be very fair. So we developed an entire process for writing a whole bunch of these things over the course of the year. And I produced several of them along the way. Uh, this was a fun uh, puzzle called The Next Generation, which was designed to trick people into thinking it was about Star Trek, but the reality was that it's actually about a one-dimensional cellular automata that was evolving in different ways for each of the different rows, so that was fun. Uh, another one that I made was called Marked Deck. Uh, the players received a deck of cards that were shuffled that had all been laser cut with a different pattern on them and you had to assemble the cards in the right order in order to form that different sort of like art there. And on the side, you saw a collection of letters. And so I won't spoil it, I won't go further than that, but there's a series of four additional steps after that in order to actually solve the full puzzle. So that was super cool. But there was a particular puzzle that I've been wanting to make from the very beginning. And I think that the desire to make this puzzle was one of the main reasons that I actually wanted to win the mystery hunt in the first place. And it all dates back to a puzzle that was actually written in 2014 by James Clark. And it was called Walk Across Some Dungeons. And before we could even see the puzzle, we saw the title. And as puzzle nerds, we kind of immediately recognized, oh, W-A-S-D, this is going to be a roguelike puzzle. And indeed it was. So the way this puzzle worked was that you opened it up and each level was its own discrete dungeon. And you could only do one of four things. You could only move in a particular direction on each turn. And your goal was just get to the staircase without dying. And so along the way, you would encounter lots of different objects of different sorts that you would need to manipulate in order to make your way through the levels. There would be enemies that would attack you in different ways and kill you. And there was just lots and lots of different types of rhythm mechanics and other puzzle mechanics that got explored. And it was brilliant. It was super, super fun to play. Uh, we got uh, a ton of fun out of solving it, uh, but it did have a few weaknesses. So the first problem was that when playing it, 
it was done in a traditional sort of telnet style, where you sent a command off to the server, the server then simulated what was going to happen and sent it back to you. And I'm sure it worked absolutely wonderful in testing, and then as soon as you had 100 teams all trying to play this at the same time, running off of a small box in a back room somewhere, the whole thing ground to a, a staggering halt. So you would send a key command, it would take you about 10 seconds to find out where your character has moved, then you could send another one, and what made this agonizing was that there was no undo. So as soon as you accidentally bumped into one of the enemies, you died, you had to start the whole thing all over again. So that was rough, uh, but I loved the concept, and I thought that it should be possible to build something that would be a tribute, that would fix those problems, and add a whole lot of other sort of new mechanics that I thought would be fun to play around with. So, uh, first lesson uh, from this talk, uh, it is totally okay to take something that someone else has built and build off of it and make it better or go in different directions or try different things. And I think that that's the whole premise behind roguelikes, and it's one of the things I love the most about them is the ever-evolving nature of them. So, going back to uh, that technical problem, uh, so this is kind of an obvious question. If the server is running slow, then don't do it on the server. Run everything locally. And uh, that was, sure, no-brainer, easy, but there's a bigger problem. The way the mystery hunt is built is on the assumption that anything and everything could be part of a puzzle. So there are many puzzles where you have to go into the actual metacode of a web page, identify the particular protocol that's being used, decipher that protocol, hack it in various ways in order to actually sort of like solve the real puzzle. So if you just gave them basically the entire game and the entire puzzle as a client, they would just immediately go into the source code and try to decipher it on the assumption that, that was the correct way to solve it. So had to avoid that. Um, so what came up with is a big wall of text. Please don't bother reading that. Uh, it's just there so that I can remember what I'm supposed to say. So it's a really simple system. When the client wants to connect to a level, it's given a unique URL by the server. The server then, or the client then knows how to render that level and plays the entire sort of like game process. And once the character actually succeeds in reaching the staircase, the client then takes the exact series of key presses that achieved that result, sends it to the server. The server is running the exact same code, simulates the same sequence forward, and if it does in fact result in victory, then it sends back a unique URL that takes you to the next level. And if it is not correct, it institutes a penalty timeout where it will not listen to you for the next minute. So in this way, it avoided any possibility of people sort of like hacking the system and uh, to the best of my knowledge, no one managed to get around this, uh, and if they did, they are too smart to actually tell me about it. So what that solution meant is that uh, if you want the same code running on both the client and the server, the easy solution is to uh, run this in JavaScript. And uh, I like JavaScript. Uh, that's kind of weird, but I think it's actually a really fun, really fast language. And so I was able to build prototype very quickly, along with the help of the amazing rot.js library. Uh, which if you are ever trying to build a web-based roguelike, this is indispensable. Uh, it handles all the rendering, and it can do all sorts of other cool stuff, uh, most of which I ended up not actually using, but it is super powerful and awesome. I highly recommend it. So once you've got this sort of like system built, uh, one of the first things you need is an editor. So I built something that would allow me to very quickly throw up together different levels. I had lots of different types of objects that I created, different entities, lots of different components and systems. And uh, once you were in the process of building the level, you could immediately jump between editing and playing it in order to sort of evaluate how well it's working. And so this worked really well. This allowed me to produce lots of sort of like quick ideas and play around with different concepts. So, once I had that, then I wanted to actually do something with this content. So I wanted a place to host it. Uh, I found out that roguepuzzles.com is available, which I was very surprised at. So I went ahead and launched it as its own thing. Uh, rather than building a menu system, I had you actually navigate through a world, which was the menu, which took you into different types of puzzles and different concepts that I was playing around with. And so once you're in a particular level, you can basically play around, and if you do badly, then the Minotaur will come and eat you, which is a problem. Uh, in general, with all the videos in this talk, I don't actually show solutions, just in case anyone does want to go and play these. Um, so built a thing that would allow me to 
show these ideas to people. And then I wanted to test and refine and iterate. So I built new levels of different sorts. So in this case, I wanted to explore the idea of arrows and how do you navigate through a space with arrows and how do you die repeatedly over and over and over again. And this wasn't just done for my own amusement. On the back end, I was collecting metrics and I managed to get a little bit of publicity about rogue puzzles so that I had a few thousand people playing on the site and I was able to look at exactly how those people were playing. Like what levels were they having fun with, what levels did they hate, and where were the choke points. And this allowed me to really quickly figure out like what made a good puzzle, what did not make a good puzzle. So lesson two, if you can release early, test within the public, and actually sort of like look closely at what real users are doing with your thing. So that was in public. In private though, I was secretly working on much harder levels. So it's everyone's favorite NetHack style puzzle. It's the Sokoban levels. I, I know, I did it. I feel bad and dirty, but whatever, it's there. So uh, obviously more arrow levels, but these ones getting much more complicated where you have to manipulate these boulders around in order to actually create a path that can get you through it, and the path has to change as you go along. Uh, added these cool portals where you can basically navigate through the level and push objects around and die. Uh, these enemies are pretty cool. So the, uh, the W's and the M's both will sit there or do their thing until they see you, at which point they'll freak out and start chasing you. So in this case, you have to build a sort of like a little bridge out of the boulders and time it just right so that you can actually get across without them ever seeing you. Uh, added some smarter enemies. So these are dragons that are actually doing pathfinding, so they find the most efficient way to kill you. Uh, lots of keys and locks and gnomes and basically just added a lot of different sort of fun mechanics that I thought would make good puzzles. And, but the thing is, I really wanted something that was really unique, really different, and something that would build on the fact that this is the second walk across some dungeons. So I made two of you. So in these levels, basically there are two characters, but your key presses affect both of them equally. And you have to try to actually navigate through without either of you killing or dying and both of you getting to the uh, staircase. Uh, it's not a totally novel idea. There are lots of other puzzle games. Uh, Link Twin is a great one on mobile that does this concept really well. But it works really well for a rogue format because, again, you're just moving things around and you can watch as people sort of like navigate through a space. So this is one concept where you're navigating through a similar environment but you're separated. And in this case, it's sort of like a maze where you need to be paying attention to what's happening in both of those different levels. Otherwise, you misstep and you die. Uh, there are other times when you're actually together and you need to take advantage of the particular movement mechanics when you're interacting with things in order to get yourself positioned correctly in order to try to actually get to the staircases at the same time. And then there are also the totally insane levels. Um, this doesn't show up super well on the projector, but there are about six different types of switches and portals on this level. There are a ton of different things that you need to actually achieve and there's lava everywhere. So you're basically navigating around, doing your best, trying not to die. And this is actually one of the very last levels and something I'm very proud of because it is very complicated, uh, but when you solve it, you feel really satisfied. So in order to know that this all was working, I had to uh, test it extensively. Uh, we have an internal system called Puzzletron that we use for evaluating the puzzles. Uh, it's no longer up, so I couldn't screenshot it, but this is a collection of basically feedback that I was receiving over the course of about a two-day period about the game. The actual list is huge. So the main thing that we learned along the process is that you don't want to be too evil. So I added one final feature that was not in the original, and that is that you could press Z to undo. And that made the puzzles into puzzles rather than just an endless pile of frustration. So lesson three, uh, it's definitely cool to be hard, but don't be too evil. And I know as a roguelike, that's a weird thing to say, but I think it actually adds a lot. So then we flew off to Boston. Uh, when running a hunt, there are about 3,000 participants and there's a team of about 70 people trying to run it. Uh, we were in two shifts of about 15 hours each and uh, did that for four days. It was grueling and awesome and crazy. But I had real-time data monitoring, so I could watch as people actually started unlocking the puzzle and even better started solving it. And in the end, the stats were great. Uh, we had about 32 teams unlock it naturally, a bunch more unlocked it later, 40 teams solved it. The average solve time was right around two hours, which I was targeting because I wanted it to be hard but not impossible. 
And so the real question is, so how do you actually solve this? So you're just moving through levels, but at the end of the whole thing, you need a phrase, you need a word, there needs to be an answer. So this was the final level that you got to where you saw all these weird characters that you'd never seen before and you weren't sure quite how they were going to attack you. But as you navigate through in the only way possible to avoid dying, the letters spell out the answer. So spoiler alert, the answer is keyboard player. <laughs> and people really enjoyed it. Uh, it was a big hit, uh, lots of great feedback from lots of different people, and uh, one of the big things that I took away that I was really uh, thrilled with is that lots of people now are talking about making a walk across some dungeons three in some future hunt, which I think will be awesome. So fourth lesson, uh, find an audience, build something that they'll love, even if it's a niche, especially within the context of the mystery hunt, find something that people can latch onto. Uh, after doing all of this, I decided I need a break, but after a while, I decided, like most roguelikes, that you can't actually let them go that much. So I decided to take this concept, uh, flesh it out, uh, build a lot more, and launch it as its own sort of standalone app. So this is something that uh, I threw together over the course of the last month or so. There's about 120 levels, um, six different dungeons. I played around with some new mechanics. So I added ice that allows you to sort of skate around, and there's all those types of mechanics. Uh, I added fire so that as you're moving through a dungeon, the uh, level behind you decides to turn itself into lava for some reason. Uh, and then my personal favorite, I added ice that is on fire. <laughs> so this is navigating through a series of levels that have portals, and it's actually a really fun and interesting mechanic, and you can build lots of cool, fun levels in this way. So uh, there are treasures to collect, and it's available on the App Store. And so my final lesson is that uh, roguelikes are definitely never finished. And uh, this has been a fun platform for me to explore all these different puzzle ideas that I really enjoy. So thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it.